This evening we're very privileged to hear from Dr. David Simon, who was brought up on a Mallee farm at Piat in the Mallee region of South Australia. He is a graduate in agricultural science from the University of Adelaide and worked in the agronomy department at the Wake Agricultural Research Institute, the University of Adelaide. He's also lectured in agricultural science courses, is in charge of the Wake Arboretum and Herbarium, and has had a lifelong interest in taxonomic botany, which for those of us like me who don't know such terms, is how you identify plants and tell one species from another. And he is well known for his work on the genius of Solanum, the family of Solanaceae, includes many important food plants such as capsicums, tomatoes and potatoes. Since his retirement he has been a volunteer researcher at the State Herbarium, which is now known as the Plant Biodiversity Centre. Dr Simon and his fellow researcher, Dr Manfred Dusatis, are currently completing a book, the first ever, on the biology and social history of the skirt pea, which has been the floral emblem of South Australia since 1961. It's my great pleasure, Dr Simon, to ask you to address. The, um, as your president said, uh, with a colleague, Manfred Nusaitis, at the um, State Herbarium, uh, we are completing a book, or pretty well have completed a book, on Sturt P. And um, it, it rather probably surprised you to know how, how little is available uh, on Sturt P uh, in terms of publications. But you've only got to look at the two tables at the back to see the extraordinary range of applications to which it is uh, now applied. Now, um, how did it begin? Well, at least five years ago, I regret to say, after a visit to the State Herbarium of German tourists who came to the front desk and said that they wanted everything published on Sturt P. And, alas, there was virtually nothing except the Allison Ashby postcard, uh, which many of you will have seen, and so a book was begun. Discovery of Sturt Pea puts it in fact amongst the earliest plants known in Europe from Australia, and this is because it was collected by William Dampier in 1699 on the northwest coast of uh, Western Australia. Dampier was by no means a botanist, he was a remarkable sailor, pirate, uh, recorder, and there's been quite an interesting recent book by him, I don't know, the, what was it, The Pirate with an Exquisite Mind, or a title similar to that, and that's well worth reading. You learn how pirates manage their ships in a sort of odd democracy, and you'll find that Robert Louis Stevenson, for instance, was quite accurate in his descriptions of Pew and uh, the rest in Treasure Island. Dampier collected the a dozen or so specimens, rather miscellaneous lot, and they took them back to England, and believe it or not, they have survived, and the Dampier specimens are in the Oxford Herbarium, and include a pressed flower head of the pea, uh, which still retains quite a lot of its colour from uh, 1699, quite remarkable. And he said on the 22nd of August, 19, 1699, I presently went ashore, carried shovels to dig for water, but found none. We found two sorts of grains, like beans. The one grew on bushes, the other on a sort of creeping vine that runs along the ground, uh, having very thick, broad leaves, and the blossoms like a bean blossom, but much larger and of a deep red colour, looking very beautiful. Well, uh, we know he was referring to pea because there is a specimen, but uh, talking about stirt pea with thick broad leaves means that he was probably describing one of the um, convolvulus that grow along the uh, beach fronts in um, uh, warmer areas, so he was not very precise there. <coughs> After um, uh, Dampier's uh, um, voyage, of course, it is, um, he published on it, and in that publication a number of his plants were described and illustrated, including this flower head of Sturt Pea, and uh, it was then called uh, Donia uh, 
Nerdies, Hollandai, Floridas, Anthus, Coxinus, Umbilatum, Dispositus, Macula, Perpurata, Notatus. It probably means that it's a red flower with a black eye. <laughs> <laughs> then there was a large gap until um, Australia was settled and um, expo exploration began. And one of the first was e Oxley's expeditions in the New South Wales. And with him he had a, um, a botanist, uh, Alan Cunningham, who um, collected Sturt P in the... Um, uh, uh, New South Wales and um, made specimens of it and um, well altogether he made something like 400 plant collections on that on that trip. <coughs> uh, he also gave it another name Cyanthus oxlii which has never been taken up <coughs> and it's interesting that immediately following his exploration in Western Australia he travelled with uh, uh, Philip uh, Parker King, uh, Mariner, uh, who was surveying the northern coast of Australia, and lo and behold, they came round to the western Australian coast, not um, not far from where uh, Dampier collected material and and collected um, Sturt P again. It's really quite remarkable that one man should have collected Sturt P both at the eastern end of its distribution and at the western end of it of its distribution. <coughs> and he says, um, I was not a little surprised to find, he's calling it Canidia speciosa this time, his original name, uh, a plant discovered in 1817 on sterile, bleak, open flats near Regent's Lake on the River Lachlan. <coughs> it is not common. I could only see three plants, of which one was in flower, um, and the island on which he collected it off the west coast is um, uh, uh, the Ile Malus of the French. So, uh, a further collections. <coughs> In the later publications, Cunningham named the New South Wales plant Trianthus oxii and the Western Australian one Trianthus dampieri. Uh, these names have lasted, um, or at least not oxii, dampieri has lasted for many, many years. <coughs> he thought they were different species, but they had now been considered to be the same. <coughs> and then the next explorer was Eyre, and he was travelling in um, South Australia at the time, and uh, travelling east eastwards from Streaky Bay to Mount Arden, uh, north of Port Augusta, he came across Sturt Peas, and he says, Today I found the most splendid creeping plant in flower growing in the, in the ranges. It is quite new to me, a very beautiful, uh, and very beautiful. The leaf was like that of the vetch, but larger, and the flower bright scarlet with a rich purple center, shaped like half a globe with the convex side outwards. It was winged and something like a sweet pea in shape. The flowers hung pendant on long slender stalks very similar to those of sweet peas, and, the greatest, and in the greatest profusion. Altogether, it was one of the prettiest and nicest looking flowers I had seen in Australia. <coughs> well, we continue with explorers for a moment, and the next was um, uh, um, <coughs> uh, Sturt <coughs> in his expeditions in um, 1840, 1844, and he said, on our return, uh, we saw that beautiful flower, Triantus formosa, in splendid blossom on the plain. It was growing amidst barrenness and decay, but, it, but its long runners were covered with flowers that gave a crimson tint to the ground. Now, uh, I think uh, many of you have probably read the uh, a book by uh, Brock, who uh, accompanied Sturt. And it would seem to me that Sturt P perhaps is credit where credit is due, because Brock and Lewis were engaged in collecting seeds and plant material quite actively, but they no, do not in fact get um, much mentioned by uh, Sturt. And um, <coughs> on December the 23rd, Brock's comment is, Lewis goes to gather seeds. And while Sturt says on the same day, 
the seeds were ripening fast along the banks of the creek and we collected as many as we could. Um, and there's little doubt that seed collected by Brock and Lewis was returned to Adelaide probably in 1845. <coughs> uh, there's one other comment there um, which shows you that under um, <coughs> further note by Brock. Lewis has been out gathering seeds and he fell in with us. Mr. Poole, having given me and Sullivan instructions to push down the creek to uh, procure acacia seeds and also birds, Mr. Poole was very anxious to get seeds for some friend of his in Old Ireland, but this under the bush, of course. Lewis being out looking for seeds, Brock is engaged in part looking for seeds, uh, and again, Brock busy this morning gathering seeds. So it was the, um, if you like, the, um, the workmen in the um, exploration party which were doing a lot of the plant gathering and included stirp peas. <coughs> now, we leave the explorers. After some time, certainly the um, showiness of stirp pea was appreciated and the earliest uses were named stirp pea appeared in the advertiser and then 1858 when it says that um, a great quantity of stirred pea has become or has been received from the north and distributed amongst florists about Adelaide I beg to remind them that that is the best time to sow it so that pea then was being recommended for growth in Adelaide in 1858 and probably the next major uh, uh, mentioned display of stirred pea was in the book by Fanny de Mole, uh, Wildflowers of South Australia. Now, I don't know how many of you know that, but it's, it's quite a rare and expensive book, hand coloured plates, and um, uh, published uh, privately by the de Mole family, and it does include a very fine plate of, of Stirp P. And that was published in um, 1861. Um, it's not known exactly who coloured all the plates in that book, but uh, uh, the family were all artistic, and it's quite likely that they um, assembled the coloured or coloured and assembled the plates as requests for the book uh, were received. Because every copy of the book that I have seen is slightly different, and I think that they were assembled one by one. The present family members believe that Fanny executed the line drawings which were sent to London for printing. The lithograph plates were returned to Australia and hand painting was carried out by Fanny and other members of the family. So that was quite an early and important uh, record of, of Sturt P in South Australia. <coughs> the um, names for Sturt P, I've gathered them together and these are uh, in um, chronological order. And the first one's Showy Donia and Beautiful Donia were based on the name given to the plant in Dampier's uh, book. They have not been taken up or used since. And then we have Dampier's Clianthus, Sturt's Pea in the advertiser, Captain Sturt's Desert Pea, Desert Pea, Sturt's Desert Pea, Glory Flower, Glory Pea, Lobster Claws, uh, used in Britain in horticultural gardens there, Deutsche Flag, German flag, I think that must be because of the black and red colours of the German flag, not used here. Um, the Love Flower, Dampier's Glory Pea, Australian Glory Pea, and then just Dampier Pea. So it has had quite a number of them of common names, but uh, now I think it has settled down to Sturt Pea, uh, that's what we're using in the book. We're dropping the desert because it tends to be misleading, but I'll say something about that a little later on. The, um, I won't go into all the details of the taxonomy <coughs> for you. It's uh, complicated. It is first called Donia. It is then called Clianthus. But tri tri the genus Clianthus is based on the New Zealand plant, Clianthus pinicius, a shrubby plant, with a flower very like uh, step P, and it uh, remained there for quite a long time. But more recent work has shown that the New Zealand plant is in fact quite distinct from the Australian uh, 
um, dirt pea, and uh, it doesn't really belong there. And then more recently, it has been transferred to the genus um, Swainsona. Now, uh, many of you will know those and have seen them in the, in, the, um, in the arid areas, very often with purple or purple-blue flowers, tend to be sprawling plants, and the flowers are in great contrast to those of surf pea. But I'm one who thinks that it does belong in the genus Swainsona. However, um, in Western Australia, particularly during the dampier uh, centenaries uh, held in the 1999 tricentenary, um, the botanist there has transferred um, step P to a genus of its own, calling it Wildampia. So you have Wildampia formosa. Uh, all very patriotic and um, good for the um, Western Australians. But uh, we're not at all sure that um, many botanists are going to take up that name, uh, Will Dampier. Why? Well, the uh, very showy flower of Stairfly is probably an adaptation to um, uh, bird pollination. And the, um, that alone doesn't really stand to make it a genus of its own. In many of the other characters, it's extremely close to Swain Sona, and I'm one who is not enthusiastic about uh, using Will Dampier. But we'll see, and <coughs> uh, we'll see whether the botanical community takes up that name. The fact that it's published doesn't mean it's that you have to use it. <coughs> yes, and just a, bit, uh, just a little bit to um, extend on the relationship with the with a New Zealand plant. Recent research uh, included step P in an analysis of the classification and number of New Zealand legumes using sequences. It included quite a number of Australian Swainsonas and the New Zealand uh, relatives. And the uh, stirred pea came out with the Swainsona species and was quite separate from the New Zealand one. So that is modern support for keeping it within Swainsona and separating it from the um, uh, New Zealand trianthus. Distribution, uh, stirred pea uh, occurs on the western plains of New South Wales but scarcely gets over the Queensland border. In South Australia it extends through a lot of our arid area but scarcely exceeds the Northern Territory border. And then in Western Australia uh, it sweeps up a bit uh, and uh, it reaches the coast or somewhere in the vicinity of, um, of Roburn. Uh, it's, it is not really a, a drought resistant and desert plant. It is not adapted to um, withstand drought. It is a drought avoider and set it is only found uh, in the wild when you have a season of, uh, of uh, a number of good years and then you may get matted of it up and then it will disappear for years. <coughs> <clears throat> there is a range of flower colours in the wild and they uh, range from um, uh, one I think illustrated on the back table they range from pure white through pink and red to dark velvety maroon uh, some of the flowers have a white boss often slightly tinged with green pink flowers um, are usually seen with bosses ranging from pale to deep pink while the bosses on the red flowers vary from pink, maroon and burgundy to deep black. Sometimes uh, some tricolour flowers occur in which the petals are white but margined with red and then you have a black boss in the centre. So there is in fact quite a range of flower colours. Mm. Step P is in fact a short-lived herb. Uh, seeds germinate and grow rapidly following infrequent heavy rains in the arid regions of Australia and flowers have been recorded mainly between July and March so that's going through most of the southern winter and uh, finishing before the end of summer but it depends very much on the timing of rainfall. Mm. 
Well, the plant is generally considered to be an annual. It's been known to persist as a perennial under exceptional circumstances. Now, quite a lot has been done in the last um, 20 years studying that the Department of Agriculture, the uh, University, uh, Flinders University, uh, have been the two main centres. And, um, oh, all sorts of things like um, uh, pollination biology and its breeding systems, uh, microbial symbionts on the roots, propagation overwhelmingly by seed, although cuttings can be, um, can be used. Now, it is thought at the time that stert pea had considerable potential as a cut flower or as a container grown ornamental plant. It's extremely variable in growth habit, floral characteristics and disease resistance. And this is a disadvantage in terms of, uh, in terms of marketing. But that uh, degree of diversity does of course give the plant breeder a great uh, opportunity for selection. And I was discussing this with uh, Manfred Eusitis and uh, all the early literature talks repeatedly of how sensitive it is to damping off and fusarium wilt. And the English and British growers, continental growers, had an appalling time with that until they used grafting. But Manfred says that by the time they had done, I think, something like 10 generations of, of growing stir pea in Adelaide, that the damping off was in fact much less of a problem. And you undoubtedly had uh, unconscious selection for resistance to um, these areas. There are common misconceptions about stir pea because it originates from a um, dry region and people think that it needs little water or fertilizer in cultivation. This is incorrect, <coughs> as mentioned above, and they respond to both water and fertilizer, which is certainly appreciated in um, Europe as a spectacular um, <coughs> garden plant. And, um, and uh, I'll just read one of the early comments on it. It said, um, one of them again, English gardeners, the Reverend Eubank in 1891, some of the summer flowers in my garden, there is just one, however, that I cannot altogether pass by, because although I must confess, it cannot be called a hardy plant, um, it cannot be called a hardy plant. Suffice to say, um, on the old lines, one must almost have lived for times of stand era <coughs> if it was to do well at all. The game was not worth the candle. But now there is no trouble with it at all, grafted upon plants as conditions. This most gorgeous of all Australian plants, I suppose inferior in point of splendour to very few things on the face of the earth, will live and grow and blossom to the astonishment of all beholders and be a sight to which it is not easy forgotten. It does well either in the glasshouse or in the open ground during the summer months and is very much admired by those who have uh, met with it. <coughs> <coughs> well, what is the future then of stir pea as a cultivated and domesticated um, plant? All of you will agree that it is a remarkable plant, but uh, it has not succeeded uh, really in the trade after about uh, 20 years of work. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be expected that the plant mm -hmm. would now be well on its way to becoming commercially exploitable commodity. And yet this hasn't happened. You might well ask the question, what is holding back the full domestication and commercial exploitation of the plant? When you think of those plants which are successful <coughs> and are <coughs> exported widely from Australia, they include, of course, the banksias, and with them, a lot of the South African uh, leucodendrons and um, gels and wax, and uh, particularly eucalyptus foliage, all of which are relatively tough, uh, physically tough, and stand uh, packing and transport quite well. But the stirp pea, if you pick it in the bud, 
it does not develop in colour at all well. If you pick a red rose in the bud and put it in water, it will usually open and be quite a preservable uh, flower. That doesn't apply to skirt pink. And you'll also recall that the flowers themselves are of a soft, delicate texture. And this is a real uh, difficulty with packing them or set, uh, sending them overseas. And I think that it's the very structure of the, the physical structure of the flower itself which is holding back its use as a um, exported flower. And of course the other thing that we sell quite widely now are dried flowers, the daisy flowers, and they of course too have a physically strong petal and take to packing, uh, yeah, packing quite well. So I'm not altogether surprised that it hasn't been a um, successful export and in some ways I'm rather glad because um, it, it means that it will still be seen in the wild and give us great joy there and won't become a, um, a common down market pot plant. The um, Aborigines used the pea for decorative purposes and it seems for no other, they had no other use and Dr Philip Jones of the museum has found a little paragraph uh, uh, de uh, detailing this dated 1900 he was saying that the Aborigines loved the bright colour and a brilliant red handkerchief or a piece of turkey twill the women especially admire this colour and seem to admire yellow but do not care much about green or blues white they are fond of and after red they prefer, prefer it for ornamental purposes to anything else and amongst them the brilliant scarlet and black Dead Sturt's Desert Pea, on account of its colours, a favourite flower, both men and women ornamenting their headgear with this most beautiful of Australian flowers. I have seen them deck their hair with green uh, crotalaria or bird flower, but they do not seem to admire it so much as the large yellowy green flower. And the lovely creamy blossoms of the corkwood, a uh, hakea, or the ha uh, handsome patula, which I don't know, they do not seem to take much notice of possibly uh, because both fruit and fade soon after being. Now, um, it's interesting that the Aboriginal name for Sturt Pea, and I'm uh, unable to pronounce them for you, but it means kangaroo's eye, and certainly that was a widespread use. And when you think of that black boss, it certainly does look like the large, dark eye of a kangaroo if you are close to it. There is only one legend of, um, Aboriginal legend of Sturt Pea that I've been able to find, and this was recorded in 1890 in New South Wales, and I suspect has been rather sort of English uh, for consumption then. The lack of records, I think, is because the southern, southern Aboriginal law was lost so um, early in our history uh, that it is probably never going to be recovered. The only uh, legend that I have is a blood one in which uh, there were two young lovers, uh, but the girl was um, apportioned to an ugly old man. Uh, there was a fight, and the uh, <coughs> spilt blood turned into stirp pea for the next um, season. Stirp pea or blood flower. Um, well, that may be as it was, and in the book we have the full copy of that um, uh, legend. And I'm very, very sorry that we've been able, unable to find any other uh, legends, and there must have been some because of this such a striking flower. There is a musical play based on the Aboriginal legend of the Sturt P, and there is a copy of the Australian National Library called uh, At Ninga or Vengeance a play and lyrics by Norma Knight and um, uh, music by Colin Knight but I've been unable to um, get that so I don't know um, what the uh, nature of it is but it is based on the, the, the only existing Aboriginal legend of vengeance that sounds like it's the same one. Despite the fact that Sturt Piggy was originally collected in Western Australia uh, and in New South Wales it has been increasingly associated with South Australia and Noel Lothian, uh, director of the Adelaide Botanical Gardens, in 1961 urged the acceptance of Sturt Pea 
as the state flower. He gave a, a brief history of the flower, its distribution, striking qualities, and the only other contender he thought was the golden wattle. But as it was already recognised in the Commonwealth Australian coat of arms, he thought it inappropriate to repeat the golden wattle in South Australia. And the Crown Solicitor, a typical judicious pro, says the adoption of the government of states desert tea as a floral emblem of this state is not governed by any particular procedure. And the legislation to authorise such uh, an, adoption, an adoption is not essential. I think the appropriate form of notification of the adoption of the emblem would be a notice under the hand of the Chief Secretary published in the Government Gazette. And all that happened, and step the came out national star. Uh, description in the um, of the armorial um, bearings of the, the state coat of arms is like again like reading some extraordinary language. Uh, the armorial bearings are described heraldically as for arms, Asia on the rising sun depicted as a rounded or an Australian piping shrike displayed and standing on the star of a gum tree proper and the crest on a wreath of or azure and you four sprig, sprigs of state desert tea proper the shield upon a compartment uh, comprising a grassy mount and in front of two vines growing there, therefrom each entwining their state proper on either side thereof stalks of wheat and barley and the extra side scattered with citrus fruits and lying on the sinister side two cogwheels with between them a miner's pick also proper together with on a scroll the name South Australia. Well, if you can draw the state arms from that, um, <coughs> but that's how it is described. Now, uh, in the little show down the bottom, uh, one of the great gaps is the um, absence of oil paintings. There are very numerous oil paintings of Sturt P. It's obviously it's a colourful and popular subject, and I'm afraid they are poorly represented here. There is one in the Adelaide Gallery that you can look at, and that's by Charles Hill, and it's entitled The Artist and His Family, and it's a picnic scene. It's usually up on the, the right-hand side of the gallery as you go in, and you'll find the family and the dog having uh, morning tea or afternoon tea under an arbour and trailed up that armour, if you look closely, is a step P, uh, certainly rather unusual in growth, and, um, but it is quite definitely a step P. And that's one of the earlier uh, uses of it in um, genre painting. It does supply a splash of colour uh, just where I think the artist would like one. And um, in um, 18... Um, 1860, certainly PC seeds would have been readily available, so it's quite possible it was being grown at that time. Other art forms are shown down there, but one of the artists who's used it quite a lot is Margaret Preston, and you'll see a book of her prints there with several examples of her prints work using Sturt P. And in fact, if you look at them in series, you'll find that the first ones she um, did uh, makes me wonder whether she had ever examined the step piece closely. Uh, they are not at all mechanically accurate and they don't really get the character of the star. But after a while, um, something happened and she began to draw step piece. I'm not expecting uh, botanical accuracy, but you've got to have a degree of accuracy to be convincing, and she changed over. And there's quite an interesting little story as to what happened. The Reverend Peter Osborne who was the son of Professor T.G. D. Osman, who was a professor of botany in Adelaide, recalls that the Prestons uh, were family friends in Sydney and that his father, the T.G. D. Osman, brought the flowers back from Coonamore via the direct rail link between Yunter, Broken Hill and Sydney. And the work log of uh, Paul Portridge, who worked at the Coonamore Research Station, uh, records that he returned Professor Osborne to Yunter Station on the 3rd of March 1930 and in that um, same diary is a record of a fine 
showing of Spirit P at um, <coughs> at that year and at that time. So there's little doubt that um, Osborne uh, took back to Sydney uh, fresh Spirit Ps for Margaret Preston to, um, to draw. <coughs> and he says that, um, uh, Peter Osborne says, these specimens of triumphs were collected by my father for the artist at Sydney Eye, Coonamore, now officially the TGB Osborne uh, uh, Ecological Reserve. <coughs> Margaret Preston had never before seen this flower, uh, which is the floral emblem of South Australia. Now the other interesting thing is that in the uh, state herbarium, we have fresh specimens of certain collected by uh, portraits at that state. So you might say that in the in the herbarium in South Australia are uh, uh, voucher specimens for the drawings that Margaret Preston did. <coughs> she did uh, quite a number of um, colour monotypes, including the Sturt P. Um, <coughs> she also designed a, a fabric which we haven't been able to trace and um, <coughs> uh, altogether used uh, Sturt P at least a dozen or so times. One of them is uh, one of her later works, the, um, uh, called the Expulsion. She was using Aboriginal uh, figures then, and you have the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is full of Australian flowers, and in the foreground of that, that Eden, uh, a trump of their peace. There's a local artist, Judith Book. Uh, who has exhibitions regularly at the Kensington Gallery, and some of you may know her, has used uh, Sturt P <coughs> for several of her works, and she did a series of paintings on Daisy Bates, the eccentric who lived for a number of years uh, in a tent uh, near Uldea, and the painting is called Daisy Bates in Ecstasy, and you'll find a photo of it uh, in, at the back. It is quite worth looking because it's quite a different use of <coughs> Sturt P in a painting. Jacqueline Hick, another local artist, has used Sturt P and um, uh, <coughs> she gets the um, prickly scrub to a tea and the dry Australian um, uh, environment, but the um, imagery of the perk is far more um, exciting in a way than the imagery of the painting. Uh, there have been a few um, fabrics and rather lost here is the fabric there of uh, uh, covering fabric designed um, locally by Team Textiles in Adelaide and uh, oh, you might have a look at it afterwards but that's a, an Adelaide production of quite a fine and effective um, fabric. <coughs> Now, uh, one of the great events of the um, centenary of South Australia was a heritage pageant. Some of you might have been old enough to remember that, held in um, 1936, and it ran at the um, Tivoli Theatre for nearly a fortnight. It was quite a remarkable production. Hundreds of people were involved, and one of them was a costume of three people uh, as dressed as Sturt Peas, uh, moving across the stage with a, a, an arid landscape in the background. Quite effective. And the uh, State Library of South Australia has issued that as a rather effective uh, card. There is an example of that down there too. Um, Sturt P has also been used on um, liturgical fabrics and um, uh, Reverend Borza has a very nice stole with um, Battle on one side and step the on the on the other. <coughs> the um, use of step P as logons, a uh, logo, sorry, and icons was first started by the field naturalists of South Australia, who used a group of three flowers for their logo as early as 1921, and you'll find a mug down there with their logo on it. And that is the earliest use of the logo that I know of. But then, of course, the Bank of South Australia, when it reorganised, also chose the Sturt P as a logo, and all of you will be familiar with the um, highly stylized three Sturt P's which make 
quite an effective and instantly recognisable logo, designed by Matthew Renfrey of Ian Kidd Design. We have had them, uh, a number of stamps and coins using Step P. Uh, I'm not sure whether I risk putting 20 cents down there, you may find um, one of them there. We haven't done very well on uh, using uh, flowers on our stamps. Uh, animals have been far more popular and including the very first stamp, including the kangaroo, but the floral stamps didn't um, uh, become popular until much later. I had a special envelope for the uh, International Botanical Congress held in Sydney, and that uh, is depicted with their things. Uh, it has become uh, an instantly recognisable flower, and in fact it is probably one of the few flowers that I think almost every single person would recognise. Now that's, um, I suppose many would recognise the Banksha, uh, but Seth P was certainly uh, instantly recognisable. And uh, one of the most charming little exhibits down there, you will see, are uh, sugared almonds produced by the almond train at Wilunga. And you'll find that this is a little oval white uh, sugared almond, and there's a little squiggle of green, which is a stem. There are three vertical stripes of red, and then there are three black dots in the middle. And it's instantly recognisable as a stirred pea. But I don't think I have ever seen such a uh, reduction of a flower in such simplicity uh, and attractiveness and still be instantly recognisable. I, I really think they're worth looking at. Now, step P in popular literature, and I'm going to skip this largely because um, not only is my time probably already overdue, but in prose, step P is usually a small uh, patch of colour in the landscape. Uh, nowhere do I know of Sturt P as the subject of prose. <coughs> um, and um, I'll just uh, read um, one of them only. And this is Catherine Susanna Pritchard, <coughs> a well-known writer and political activist. And her book, Tuna Do, which was also quite a famous one, dealt with the Aboriginal uh, treatment, <coughs> and includes Sturt P in the landscape of cattle mustering in Western Australia. Um, and this is an early association of the flower with blood. The mulga now and then was hung with pale yellow castle blossoms and long flat seed pods. Paper daisies spreading drifts under the trees and away over the flat land. Trails of the desert peas <coughs> spilt new bright blood beside the track. When Hugh swung off his saddle to have a drink from the water bag hung around his horse's neck, he picked a spray of desert peas. Phyllis stuck it through her hat band, and they went on again at the quick walk stock horses travel by. <coughs> now there you just have it as a flash of colour in the landscape. And that applies to almost all the um, prose references. I've got quite a number of them here. We haven't time to, um, to read them, but much more... Oh, what's this one? Oh, May Gibbs also used some step P, and most of her drawings were based on the flora close to Sydney and from the Blue Mountains. But one of her latest works was um, um, Prince Dandelion, and um, that was published as late as 1952. Now here, uh, of course, her uh, bag, big bag Bankshire men are uh, well known, and her imagery of Xanthorias as with beers is also well known. But in Prince Dandelion, Captain Sturt P was captain of the Rosie Morn, which is an early petunia. And the heroine, Dorothy Perkins, was taken safely home. But a fragment of um, May Gibbs' play with words is here. Captain Sturt P gave her a scarlet bottle brush and honeycomb brought all the way from gumnut land to brush her maiden hair. Uh, uh, <coughs> highly imaginative, but also highly impractical. In, in I think using a honeycomb to brush your hair might be somewhat bizarre. In none of the prose examples does Sturt P play more than an incidental role colouring the landscape. Uh, 
There are many poems that make reference to stirred pea, some with incidental mention of the flower, and others um, with which it is the main subject of the verse. The earliest ones that I've found um, what's this? Uh, in the bulletin, 1898, is just an incidental mention, and it's in a part of Australia where stirred pea certainly wouldn't grow. So we'll leave that one. And then um, there is quite a nice one by Charles Sinter, um, he died in 1944. He was a medico and he practiced both in New South Wales and then in, in South Australia in the mid-north. But he was noted for his gentle humanity and there is a poem in the spring and I include it because of its reference uh, in part to several other flowers and it's rather attractive. Then I'll, I'll see if I can read it for you. The spear grass is in blossom end. Its scent is in the air. The wind is waving of it like I've seen it wave your hair. It looks a good bit like it too, a sort of smoky brown. I suppose you never thought I'd seen your hair when it was down. I hadn't got no right to do. I never said I had. Well, don't get cross about it, Em. It doesn't look too bad. The so long Mary's is in bloom. They're looking grand this year. They're big and blue just like your eyes, but not as soft and clear. The desert peas are flowering down to Balaclava South. As red, there's nothing ain't as red except the hatch your mouth. The honey myrtle's coming out the back of Thompson's farm. You're just as soft and sweet and white as halfway up your arm. But something seems a saying as, there's something as I miss. Hold on a minute, Emma. Can't you give a cove a kiss? <laughs> <coughs> and this is uh, uh, one of the first that, uh, in which the spirit P is um, uh, the subject of the verse and um, it's I suppose a somewhat old fashioned style now but uh, if you'll allow me I'll just go through it beside the blue and misty mauve the rose and cream of pastel painted peas there glows a splendid splash of colour leaping flame the spirit that can brook no slavery an outlaw no captivity can tame the vivid black and scarlet desert pea. Beneath the glory of the sun's red rays, it, it rioted among the greens and greys of mulga scrub and saltbush, while the heat enveloping the parched and breathless land with pitiless power and blinding splendour beat upon the dazzling, dazzling thirsty, burning sand. Rejoicing in the long, hot, golden days when earth was weary neath the shimmering haze it raised its gay defiant careless head its blackness bright as polished ebony rich as a smouldering coal its glowing red the child of sun and desert fearless free the flower that placed their fiery arabesque upon the sand now strike a picturesque exotic note of colour here with these pale garden blooms no part at all have they who long the desert and the desert ease, the burning price of clear sun flooded days. Uh, that's quite early, oh, 1924. As I said, that's the earliest one that I've been able to find uh, with Stat P as the subject. And then there's the uh, important poet, poet uh, A.D. Hope, uh, died in 2000. Uh, important a teacher, psychologist, academic and a leading poet and he wrote an important uh, uh, poem called Australia. Now it was written in 1939, just before the war and it wasn't published until 1943. It presents a caustic view of white settlement in Australia. Uh, the um, last stanza is striking with somewhat oblique reference to the step P and I'll only read two stanzas. Yet there are some like me turn gladly home from the lush jungle of modern thought to find the Arabian desert of the human mind hoping if still from the deserts the prophets come such savage and scarlet as no green hills dare springs in that waste some spirit escapes the learned doubt the chatter of culture hates which is called civilization over there a wonderful phrase such savage and scarlet as no green hills there. Uh, we'll skip um, Rex Ingemels and go to Bill Harney. 
who most of you will know of, a um, well-known raconteur, author, bushman, drover, patrol officer, and he lived and worked in Central Australia, and he had a rollicking poem called West of Alice, which describes the um, total destruction of the plants and animals in the face of the road grader levelling uh, the track. And the poem was written near Tolgara, not far north of our border, in 1953, and this is one of the stanzas. Um, we pass where stirred peas clothe the earth with a scarlet sweep of flowers and burst through green acacia trees that, that send down golden showers. The parakelia's purple bloom is crushed in the dry red sand when the bright blade sweeps as the great it creeps o'er the strange, the stern, strange land. It's quite a good poem and um, describes his experience sitting on a grader crashing through the scrub. And another one, Roland Robinson, in this step he is, is incidental, but a nice strong poem. And it's called The Bloggers and it was written in Central Australia at Deep Well and, and I think it's just quite a haunting image, The Bloggers. Because I, and this is Roland Robinson, because I came at dawn and stood outside these, those ruins on the plain where, spilt among the stones like blood, the desert peas spread out its stain and saw out of the pale dark sky where solitary stars were dying those five oncoming bloggers fly with quoke and quoke quoke of their crying to pass with outstretched necks and fringed beating wings above my head towards the fire of day the thin eroded ranges parrot red. <clears throat> I stood immortal there. I burned in ageless youth and from its mood renounced the world again and spurned all but that fierce proud solitude. None of those uh, poems use the Aboriginal name of Sir P, which is Malu Kura or Malu Kura Kura, and there is a, a little book published by a local poet and companion called um, 14 Pictures and 14 Verses. And um, it is privately printed and is certainly not very well known. And this is called Desert P. And um, uh, refers to the parting of these two friends. I leave as the Malu Kura opens. The long, slow days of our love have finally come full season for this parting. Let her strength cascade across our earth. Her fingers tend your feet, and let her red and violent flower fill my absence. <clears throat> and very different from that is um, Jan Wade's um, uh, book of uh, Australian flower fairies. She has a winged ballet dancer with a tutu of step pea flowers or within a general spray of step pea and her voice is leaping flames of scarlet dressed in red and black a splash of splendid color across the desert spread racing random riot dance across the sand mats of gray green foliage in a dry brown land i think it would be a bit of a withered fairy but still and, uh, it's quite uh, an appropriate use of a plant which has by then become an icon. Mm. Uh, Kevin Gilbert, a well-known Aboriginal poet, writer and activist, and he published a little book called Charles Dream, which consists of short paragraphs in very direct and terse language describing plants and animals and features of the landscape and there's a, a, an appropriate photograph on the facing page and he say, says of the desert peas, very short, I stared hard at the desert peas, it had two eyes that was plain to see, I blinked, then winked, then stared again, but it didn't blink back at me. And uh, he's using it again, uh, uh, Aboriginal concentrating on the eye of the flower rather than the colour. However, now we come to stronger stuff. Um, Rachel McMaster, Flying the Tooth, 
sees the plant in an aggressive and bloody turn, spurts desert pea. Vicious squadrons from under earth, in fierce battle order, someone called Hawk a million years ago, smart, sharp militia men, intense presences in blurred paddock corners, bright black brain scimitars, cockatoo press dipped in blood, slivers of live flesh ripped from animals, cannibal flowers that feed on shocked eyes, and uh, increasing violence. And I think this is probably um, one of the few flowers of Australia that have attracted such a strong um, language, and we'll have some more still. <coughs> and here's uh, Timoshenko as a knee, as a knee, uh, living and working in Canberra, a poet, and he wrote um, a book called Anniversary, in which every day of the year had a verse, and they were linked with historical events in, uh, in Australia on that particular day. So for um, the 23rd of October, 1844, Sir was viewing Sir Pease in arid Australia. And uh, as the Nardis says, of Sir Pease in the country, even driving a car, you carry water here and think about it, noting presence or absence, planning every necessary stop around it with a promise, threat, its various likely places. How much more the worry travelling with thirsty horses. Still a flower can stop an expedition. Throughout back Australia, west of wherever you happen to be, east of the westmost reach of the desert sea, a silky, hairy annual, perhaps perennial form, forever running out on prostrate branches, to show off long stalk outward facing flower clusters, sentinels watching, ancient soldiers defending, petal shields of red on a black central boss and rich in impossible intensity. Even the ground beneath the flower takes on its hue and holds the thirsty men in admiration. A Latin name is noted in the narrative, but this plant's chosen to discover us. Uh, of course, that is quite wrong. It was discovered by, uh, by a spare, but nevertheless that link is with him. <coughs> Uh, very well. Mm. And we're coming to the end. And here's a one by Muriel Lenore, uh, which really gives you quite a, um, a potted history of Sturt Pea. Interesting for a poet. Sturt's Desert Pea, named first for Dampier after 1699, Cleanthus Formosus was a happier choice. Beautiful, glory flower, though others long before it had called it Malu Kura Kura, the eye of the kangaroo. Just past Mount All Alone in the Gaulers, Eyre first recorded it in South Australia. A most splendid creeping plant, the flower bright scarlet with rich purple centre. The floral emblem for the dry estate, it flaunts dark lips beside the desert tracks. There is a legend too of beautiful lovers and spilt blood, Aboriginal legend, more Camelot than Cocopa. Now it features in supermarket specials can be grown from seeds soaked in tepid heat. And recently two Adelaide banks battled in court to own the symbol of such dangerous sexuality. And then Kate Llewellyn, another local writer, uh, writes very intensely, often drawing on personal experience, and this is a somewhat unsettling poem, I think. Spirits Desert Pea. Blood, flowers and tears made one, red tears of the desert, when Philippa knelt at the prostrate plant on the sand, we joyfully found her silk scarf matching the black and red flowers a thousand mi miles inland. I remember she knelt on the pavement beside her son when he fell like a star from the window. How his blood bloomed. Francesca, his sister, recognised his big feet, scrawl still in flowers. Um, and then John Bray, uh, Chief Justice, uh, reflects on the mean treatment that was meted out to Sturt after all his labours. And the plant is reduced to a single word at the end of the verse that is powerfully and effectively placed. 
And by the time Bray was writing, Step P had become the state star, an icon for South Australia, and had sort of socio-political symbol. <clears throat> I'm looking at a portrait of Captain Charles Sturt. When I survey the weary greyhound face and note how deep times were in uh, etch and chase the lion's privation and frustration draw, I think the state's rewards were scant and poor. Blindness, demotion, though as parting cheer, a pension of 600 pounds a year. For these, the river, her nativity, that it exercised image, the inland sea. Still for his fame, death sets no final close. See, South Australia, after years, bestows in her own fashion immortality, a football team, a tavern, and a pea. <coughs> and lastly, a poem by Margaret Bernard, who's a teacher of French and a theology student, I've written a special for her, for us. Um, and we finish with this. Step P. Red fodder for explorers' horses, love lies bleeding, no. Rises, stands, shouts, dark flower of Adonis, no. Bright wound of passion, bright blood of passion, black wound of pain, forth like a burning torch till the desert blaze with Marley's good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Simon. Uh, I'm sure there are questions out there amongst you all, so if you'd like to direct uh, questions to me, I'll repeat them as we don't have a, a second microphone this evening. There are limited records of pollination by birds, but they have been observed both at the cultivated plants at the Black Hill and in the wild. And I think it was wood swallows in the wild and the honey eaters at the Black Hill. Uh, and they served there build at the, um, the bottom of the, of the keel and you'll find if you push that down the style and stigma are uh, pushed out and the pollen is immediately available to probably go on the chin, the chin of the bird. Uh, a wall hanging that was behind the reception desk at an advertising agency I was associated, associated with. The pen years dropped and I can now recall the name of the advertising agency. It was Ogilvy and Mather in Greenhill Road and they had a spectacular hanging uh, which went ceiling high and to the floor of the Sturge Desert Pea. And it lifted my spirits every time I came through the door. I very much regret that I haven't seen that one. I hope that it's still there and um, I, can, I can look at it sometime. It was a, a, a fabric hanging, hanging, was it? Not a painting, but um, woven or appliqued or embroidered. Oh, right. Yes, right. Well, I mean, it certainly is widely used, but I haven't seen one as, uh, as uh, grand as that. Well, it falls to me to propose a vote of thanks on your behalf to Dr. Simon for his most informative, enjoyable and very broad-ranging uh, lecture this evening on, on the Sturt P. Uh, I, I was thinking my first encounter with the Sturt P I think was probably on the front of a railway ticket. The only time the railways of Australia seemed to be able to get their act together were to have a joint ticket on passenger trains began the Indian Pacific and what have you and uh, rather than have anyone's train on the front they very wisely steered clear of that and they had all the floral symbols of each the floral symbol of each state, the Sturt P for South Australia, the Blue Bell for Tasmania, the Waratah for New South Wales, I, I think I probably once knew them when I, I spent more time travelling by train and uh, it wasn't until many years later that I had the privilege of seeing uh, a batch of sturt pea growing on the side of the road on the way to Alice Springs. Little did I know, or little until this evening, the, the full story behind such a beautiful, beautiful flower and I think the words of the old English reverend all those years ago still ring true today. Uh, please, thank you. Everyone. <laughs> Dr. Simon, thank you very much, and everybody, please make sure you look at the display which Dr. Simon has gone to such trouble to bring here this evening for our enjoyment. So we, we've been honoured to have you here with us this evening. Thank you very much.